graphs. Wait, no. Turn that negative parabola upside down because today we're not dealing with those nasty graphs your teachers make you do in Algebra 2 or like those conics that your pre calc teacher makes you make. We're talking about CS graphs, which in my opinion are a lot nicer. They're beautiful. So pretty. See, look how pretty that graph is. It even has like two strands of hair coming in. No, you know what? But actually though, this is a CS graph without those nasty hair thingamajiggers. There you go, a CS graph. But what in the world is it? That just looks like a bunch of circles and sticks. What's the point of that? Turns out that this nonsense over here is the foundation for all of computer science. Maybe not all, but like an important part of USCO for sure. So basically a graph by my definition and probably most people's definition is just nodes connected by edges. Okay, so these circles over here, these boys over here, are all called nodes. And then they're connected by these lines over here, which are called edges. Epic. In this video, I'm going to be throwing a lot of terminology at you, because in Musical, you need to learn a lot of terminology to understand a lot of algorithms, because algorithms need graphs. And to know a graph, you gotta know the terminology. So, hence, let us begin with directed and undirected. So, what we look at over here is an undirected graph, because the edges don't have a direction. To make a directed graph, we just put arrows instead of just lines. So now we have an undirected graph, we have a directed graph, and now we gotta look at the subtypes. So, undirected is like no subtypes, it's boring nonsense, just like straight lines, who cares about that? But within directed, there's something called a directed acyclic graph. And, as you probably could tell by the name, it means it doesn't have cycles. Basically a cycle means that you can go from one node and get back to the node like just by going on edge. So this right here is a DAD or a directed acyclic graph because there's no way to get back to this node once we leave it. But if it was not a directed acyclic graph it would look something like this. See like if we start from this boy over here and we go over here we can get back by going over here and then going over there. Directed cyclic graphs are pretty bad not gonna lie. All right first round of terminology is done moving on and now we got to talk about trees. Yeah, like the trees that you grow in your backyard. Yeah, I'm totally talking about those trees. So basically a tree looks like this. And now from this really anatomically correct diagram of a tree, we could tell you that these over here are the leaves, scientifically called the leaves of a tree, and then this is scientifically called the trunk of a tree. Very cool. No, okay, fine, fine, fine. I'll do the CF tree, fine. Unfortunately, this tree is not quite as aesthetically pleasing as a, you know, actual tree, but, but we'll have to just do with this because this is what CS defines it as and that's what we gotta go with. So what's cool about trees is that they have no cycles. So basically there's only one path between any two vertices. So if I leave this vertice, the only way to get back to this vertice is to come back along the same edge. Huh, maybe we could transform this into a tree, you know? It looks too ugly, let's, let's do this. That's one good looking tree if I do say so myself. But hey, there's more to know about trees. They're not just these little stick things that don't have cycles in them. They also have exactly n minus one edges. So if you have n nodes, that means you have n minus one edges. Another thing you gotta know about trees is that they're undirected. And Moblamo, well, that's all you gotta know about graphs. So why do we care about these graphs and trees made out of sticks and stones? Well, the answer is because Yusuko is very dependent on it. It may not look like much, it's just like unsophisticated, boring, but it's super useful. That's because essentially every single usical problem can be reduced to a tree or a graph. By the way, a tree is a type of graph, so yeah, it can be reduced to a graph. So let me tell you about how to recognize graphs in usical problems. So the first type of graph is like a 2D graph, like it's a 2D plane, right? So basically each of these squares is a node, and then to move from one square to another, the edge is this length one. We're basically saying that if we have like our starting node here and then it connects to these two nodes, and then we connect to this node, and then we connect to that node, and so on and so forth. So we just reduced our our like weird thing to something that's concrete. And now we can run shortest path algorithms, everything. Another common thing that Yusuko likes to throw at you is cows in pastures. Oftentimes Yusuko basically has like, you have a pasture and there's a cow in it. And then it's connected to a bunch of other pastures by bi-directional paths, right? And then it'll tell you like there's n pastures, right? So let's say there's four pastures. And then it tells you, like, 1 and 4 is connected with a path of length 4. And then 1, 3, and 3, 4 is co connected by a path of 1 and a path of 2. And then it'll ask you, what's the shortest path? But we just reduced it to a graph right here. It's not just some arbitrary thing that's in a usical problem. Now it's a graph, and we can run tons of algorithms on it. Essentially, anything where there's a state and a movement between states is a graph. 
let's say we're just playing a game, right? Let's say in that game, you win a point for every question you get right. And you get a max of three points. If you get a question wrong, however, your score gets reset to zero. We can literally represent that by a graph. Let me show you the world. So we got zero, one, or two, or three points. And then, basically, if we get a question right, we can get from zero to one, so we draw an edge over here. And then C for correct. However, if we get it wrong at zero, we stay at zero, so our incorrect would just go back here. And then if we get it correct at one, we go to two. Otherwise, we go back to zero. And then same for two, and then same for three, basically. Except you go back to three. And this over here is called a finite state diagram. That's not really relevant, but basically this is showing you that basically any problem can be reduced down to a graph. And why do we want to reduce it down to a graph? That is the question. That's because graphs, you can apply every single algorithm to. You can run BFS, you can run DFS, you can run Dijkstra's, you can run Kruskal's, you can run Prins, you can run everything, literally everything. So when you approach a usable problem, first try to reduce it to a graph. If it doesn't lend itself to a graph, there are other algorithms you can use. But first step first, reduce it to a graph. All right, well that's all good and all, but like, what's the point of knowing about graphs that I can't represent them in programming? So now we gotta talk about how to represent graphs in programming. All right, graph representation. The first thing is something called an edge list. So this edge list is basically the form that all Ezeco problems give you your graphs in. They basically give you each edge in a graph and it tells you how many nodes there are in the graph. So let's first define what graph we want to represent. All right, so let's say this is a graph we want to represent, right? Usical will probably give it to us in the form. There's an edge from zero to two, and it has length four. There's a path from one to two, and that's length six. And then there's a path from two to three, and that's five. And it would tell us that there are four nodes. Okay, so that's basically exactly what an edge list is. So an edge list representation is exactly what I said it was. Zero, two, four. 1, 2, 6, and 2, 3, 5. So it basically has the starting vertex of the edge, the end vertex of the edge, and the length of the edge. Epic! Now a couple algorithms use edge lists, for example, cross goals uses edge lists, but in general, you're probably gonna have to convert this graph into other forms in order to actually do algorithms on it. So the second form you gotta know is called the adjacency matrix. I know you've probably had enough matrix multiplication in pre-calc, but today, it's a different matrix because this is just a matrix of zeros and ones and you don't have to do any arithmetic on it. It's epic. So basically an adjacency matrix is an n by n matrix where n is the number of nodes. So we would do our matrix over here. And then within each block, you put the distance between the two nodes. So the distance between zero and zero is zero because it's the same thing. The distance between zero and one is like negative one because they're not even reachable from each other. The distance from two to zero is four. And then from 3 to 0 is negative 1. And then we fill it in just like that. Alright, cool. So this is how you do adjacency matrix. You would do the adjacency matrix if you want to check really quickly whether two edges are connected. It's really useful if you know which two vertices you're looking at and you just want to find out what the distance is between them. The problem with an adjacency matrix is that it's hard to find which vertices are adjacent to a given vertex. For example, if I had one and I wanted to find which vertices are next to it, I'd have to go through the whole row of the adjacency matrix in order to find what's adjacent to it and that's just not efficient. So we got an alternative, the epic adjacency list. The adjacency list basically says for each vertex, which vertices are next to it. So for example, in this graph, we have four vertices, so zero, one, two, three. So the only one that is adjacent to zero is two, right? So we put a two comma the length of the edge. For one, the only thing that's adjacent to it is two. So we do two comma six. For two, there are three things adjacent to it. So we would put a 0, 4, because that's an edge with length 4. And then we would put a 1, 6 and a 3, 5. For 3, the only thing that's neighboring it is 2, so we just put a 2, 5, because that's the length of our edge. So cool, this is basically an adjacency list. And the reason why this is so cool is because you could start from one vertex, and you could immediately know what its neighbors are and how far away they are. The adjacency list is super, super useful for Dijkstra's, for Prim's, for a lot of the algorithms that we're going to use. So. Generally, I like to keep my graphs in adjacency list, and if necessary, I'll convert them to other things later. So in code, your edge list is literally going to be a variable length list with triplets for each of your edges. And each triplet will have the start, end, and length of your edge. And then for adjacency matrix, that's just a fixed size n by n array, and you fill it in with the length between the two vertices. And last but not least, we got adjacency lists. So basically an adjacency list is going to be a fixed, n array filled with variable length lists. That was confusing. 
But basically, if we're talking about language specific in C++, it would be an array of vectors. In Java, it would be an array of array lists. And then in Python, it's just going to be a list of lists because everything is list in Python. Python, more like list on, am I right? Ha! Huh? Ah, oh, okay, I'm too good, too good at these puns, not gonna lie. So basically, each variable length list will store which vertices are adjacent to your current row. So for example, if I'm in row 0 of our n length array, that would store all the adjacent vertices to 0. If you want to store a length as well, you just, instead of putting just the neighbor, you put a pair with the neighbor and the length of the edge. Alright, very cool, that's all you guys gotta know about graphs. Once you know this, you're basically ready to go into the algorithms, and I will be talking about BFS next time because now that you have your graph, now we're ready to run BFS on them. So basically the main takeaway is always keep track of graphs when you're doing a use-to-go problem because once you reduce a problem down to a graph, there's a lot more options for you to apply algorithms to them. Not all use-to-go problems are applicable to graphs, but a lot of them are and just knowing how to use graphs and being comfortable with like their properties is like really, really important. So thank you guys so much for watching. As always, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe for more. If there's any specific thing you want me to cover in the use-to-go crash course, let me know down in the comment section. And other than that, thank you guys again for watching, and see you guys next time.